Good morning. Welcome to our online Sunday School lesson for February 20th of 2022. This is Aceville Baptist Church Sunday School lesson from Anderson, South Carolina. As we start today, uh, as we usually do, let me request you uh, to be in prayer uh, for those that we've been praying for that are sick with the COVID. Uh, also, uh, the other things that's going on in our, in our community right now, we've got several on our prayer list that needs our prayer. Uh, had a good friend this week. His wife's 47. Uh, she's in the Greenville Hospital right now suffering with COVID. Uh, they requested our prayer. Uh, they sell in our church that's fighting COVID. Uh, pray for those uh, that are suffering bereavement uh, and, and pray for comfort for those families. As you know, the uh, widow of the former pastor, Price, of our church, Miss Grace Price, uh, passed away this week. We pray for that family. We love that family so much. Uh, we're praying for that family. Uh, also had a very good friend that I worked with uh, uh, in my yearly, earlier days. Uh, you know, he was a machinist that worked with the plant with me over there, uh, but he passed away this week to pray for them. Also pray for a good, very good friend that looked like he broke his leg this week while he was at work. So. I'm praying for those. Pray for our church. Pray for our church leaders uh, that they will always follow God's direction. I want to send a word out, a word of thanks out to Eden and all our youth of our church uh, for a very nice uh, Valentine banquet last Sunday night. Uh, haven't heard how the uh, the tipping went on and that how well that was going to mission, but I haven't heard the outcome of that. But I'm sure it's going to be nice because they did wait. Uh, the waiters and waitresses were very nice to us. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, today, uh, our lesson uh, is a very important lesson uh, that we all need to understand. And I'm trying to break it down today so that it will be simple for us to understand. The title of today's lesson is The Future Seen. Uh, believers can live with confidence knowing that God's kingdom is eternal. Uh, during our Sunday school lesson last week, we discussed how hard things uh, have gotten in this last year. Uh, it seems like our grocery shelves are empty. Prices of what uh, things used to be have doubled and tripled and quadrupled. Uh, you can't even get uh, the, some of the things we need. Uh, evil is on every corner of every street. It's not just in New York and San Francisco anymore. Uh, it's right here in our own personal communities and towns. The leaders uh, every, all around uh, our country has evil leaders. Uh, those evil leaders are making decisions that are against all beliefs in our country and against the Bible. Uh, they seem like they're more evil than ever before in the past. Last Sunday, uh, we gave the only answer as we talked about in our class to all this evil. Uh, we as believers have to stay close to God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He's our only hope during all these turmoils. So I guess the question for today's lesson is, and it was in our commentary again, uh, Janice Meyer, the author of the commentary, did a fantastic job this week. I'm using several of her thoughts and quotes in our lesson today. So she started out by asking the question, how do we make sense of all this chaos in our lives right now during these chaotic times? The answer comes again from our commentary, and I'm going to use it this week. Uh, the answer uh, that we can only uh, have any hope is with a personal relationship with God. Coupled with a biblical view of history, uh, not only will help us survive each day, but will help us enable, and enable us to grow stronger in our faith each day. I know personally, and I've shared this with you before, over the last couple of years with this pandemic and having to remain at home a lot more than I used to, uh, I've studied more of my Bible than I ever have. I've prayed more in the last couple of years than I ever have. And yes, I've grown closer to my Savior and my relationship with Christ. Several of us were discussing some history of our country 
uh, of our people and how you must study the Old Testament uh, last Sunday during our Sunday school lesson to really understand the part of the New Testament and understand what Jesus really did when he hung on the cross. You have to study the Old Testament to understand how important it was what he did for us. Uh, the commentary gave a great introduction to our lesson this week, and I'm going to share that with you because it's so important to understand today's lesson. The author of the commentary said there are four primary aspects that characterize a biblical view of history. The first thing, biblical history focuses on God's providence. So I look up that word for you. Providence is care by God for his people as he guides them in their journey of faith and in their individual lives and still in their lives and in their walk of faith accomplishing uh, their purpose and his goal for our lives. In the Old Testament, we see how God and used pagan nations to guide his own people closer to him and teaches his people to stay close to him, to embrace him as their creator and Lord of history. As I studied this week, I thought how great it would be if the leaders of our country would just embrace Jesus as their creator and take his directions for the directions they make for our country. The second thing that the commentator, uh, com the leader, the writer of our commentary mentioned, a biblical view of history reflects a linear chronology. Now get this, moving toward a goal that God has established. For you see the opposite of this, and many secular people view this, if you study biblical history, it is a circular view, thinking uh, you study history as it's going to keep repeating itself over and over and over again. You'll find in today's lesson that that's a wrong view. Uh, we are marching forth and getting closer to the end of time. I believe we're closer now than ever before to Jesus Christ fulfilling his promise when he said, I will return and claim those that worship me and take them to heaven to be with me. Third thing, a view of biblical history records a chron chronology of history. The meaning is found always by those that have a personal relationship with God. And it is God who will bring this world to its end for those that are called. The fourth thing, biblical history provides hope, genuine hope. God is leading us to a wonderful climatic action for those that trust him. And for those that don't, there's an eternal destiny in hell for them. For those that trust him, there's an eternal destiny for us in heaven. The background of today's lesson is this. During the seventh, then the sixth century BC, the prophet Daniel saw the Babylonians overtake Jerusalem, Israel, and Judah, and take the Israelites captive over into Babylon. Then we saw last week how the Medes and the Persians overtook the Babylonians and overtook the exiles. As a result, many Jews and exiles wondered what lay ahead for them and if God would really protect them and if they would ever be able to return back to Israel. God's message, and this is the Old Testament, in chapter 7 of Daniel, gave his people that were in exile hope during their hard times. That same message, which we're going to study today, should give us hope for our future. Remember as we study, believers can live with confidence because they know God's kingdom is eternal for those that trust him. Biblical theology. There are many types of writings in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, Long ago God spoke to the ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. As we study the Bible today from Daniel chapter 7, we see how God used the prophet Daniel and indeed communicated a message to his people 
that he should be given to his people that were in exile with him along with them as they were in exile. God's prophets use many different types of writings to tell us the stories that God wanted told to us. These included using story writings, using history, using poetry, using letters, using laws, using them wisdom sayings, using proverbs, and using parables. Daniel chapter 7 introduces us to another type of writing that God used through his prophet Daniel. That is called, and I'm going to try to say this, apocalyptic literature. In this chapter 7, Daniel himself has a dream, and he has a dream about the future of the exiles and about our future too, if you look at it the way the commentary did. I learned this week, and I want to share this with you, what then is the purpose of apocalyptic literature? Why did God give Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter 7 and John in Revelation a view of the future? Seven reasons. And look with me. This is important. One, to share the difference in, between good and evil. Two, there will come a time when the world will be dominated by evil. Look at our country today. Look at our world. It has been quoted the worst, the most evil rule in all of history is happening right now. God shows the way along as he accomplishes his ultimate purpose. The fourth thing is symbolism. Symbolism are things like seven and ten means complete. Horns mean power. Clouds means for our easy movement to show his view. And there's many other symbolic symbols that we will study today. Fifth thing, God will bring a catastrophic outcome to those who do not believe in him before the end of our world. Example, this alone is enough to cause us to believe and follow Christ. The things that will happen in the last times are documented, so we will not be ignorant is why he shares with us apocalyptic literature. You see these things happening every day now that were mentioned years ago that would happen before he returns. You, you see that uh, these events that we see now during our lives that are recorded way back in Bible times. In the seventh thing, biblical history calls for all believers to stay faithful during difficult and chaotic times. Now let's look at Daniel chapter seven from the viewpoint of it being apocalyptic literature. Daniel chapter seven, verse one. If you don't have any books, turn with me in your Bibles now as we go. There's a lot of scripture, so I want you to stay with me. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream with visions in his mind as he was lying in his bed. He wrote down the dream, and here is a summary of his account. Daniel's vision came in the first year of King Belshazzar. You remember last week we studied this was the son of King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember in chapter 5, he had a wild party in the palace using the vessels that were stolen from the temple in Jerusalem. As Daniel dreams, the Bible says, he recorded everything down and wrote a summary account of the dream. Let's look now at verses two and three from chapter seven. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I was watching and suddenly the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea. <coughs> four huge beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. His vision came at night, yes, but this also symbolizes his vision came at the darkest time in the history of the Israelites as they were in bondage. They were in bondage in a foreign country being ruled by an evil leader. How much more can they take, Daniel was thinking. How much more do we have to take of this evil in our world? 
As he dreamed, he saw four winds of heaven stir up the great sea. Four symbolizes four directions on each, the north, the east, the south, and the wind, which basically means the entire earth. Winds symbolizes God's power. The picture Daniel shows how the entire world is in a chaotic state of evil, with evil ruling in every corner of the world. Let me ask, do you see any of this today in our lives? As the dream continued, four beasts emerged. These beasts looked like large animals, and they had great power. Many scholars believe these four beasts represent the four great military powers during that time that Daniel lived. And those were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The notes say these four countries were like four large animals when, that, when they meet. They were all violent to each other, trying to overtake the other, trying to get the upper hand against each other. Then Daniel goes on with his dream. Chapter 7, verse 4. The first beast was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. I continued watching until its wings were torn off. It was lifted up from the ground, set on its feet like a man, and given a human mind. The first animal was like a lion with eagle's wings. This represented Babylon and also King Nebuchadnezzar. The wings being torn off symbolize how ne King Nebuchadnezzar was stripped by God of his power and his mind, and he was forced to walk around like an animal, live like an animal, and eat like an animal. Then he was restored seven years later to his kingdom. Then at the end of it, that kingdom was taken away as he died, and his son replaced him, Belshazzar. Then Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, suddenly another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear, it was raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, gorge yourself on flesh. The second beast resembled a bear. This represents the Medo-Persian Empire, which was known for its great size and ferocity in warfare. The three ribs in its mouth represent Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt which it would soon conquer and put in the exile, just like Israel and Judah. Then verse 6, After this, while I was watching, suddenly another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings on a, of a bird on its back. It had four heads and was given dominion. The third beast appeared like a leopard with four wings and four heads. This symbolized Greece, which would overtake the Medo-Persians, after it conquered Babylon. The flying leopard symbolized speed as it could fly and how fast this new country, Greece, would conquer its foes. The four heads and four wings also symbolize how it would overtake the four points of the world, or in other words, the whole world. Daniel chapter seven, verse seven. After this, while I was watching in the night vision, suddenly a fourth beast appeared frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong, with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. It was different from all the other beasts before it, and it had ten horns. And the fourth beast appeared, ugly, frightening, dreadful, scary, incredibly strong, with large iron teeth. This beast was the most powerful of all, and would devour and crush and trample the other three. This beast had 10 horns. By the second century BC, Rome would overtake Greece as the prevailing world power. Then power and control set them apart from all the other nations and they began to conquer all the other nations. The 10 means complete, means this beast would complete the job. Then Daniel chapter seven, verse eight. While I was considering the horns, suddenly another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. And suddenly in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a human, and a mouth that was speaking arrogantly. Then Daniel saw a little horn pop up on the fourth beast, 
This little horn grew bigger and overtake took three of the 10 horns that were already there. It grew bigger and grew eyes. This little horn represented a ruthless world dictator, a man of lawlessness, a man doomed to destruction. Daniel's dream revealed that in the last days, powerful kings would also rise up and powerful countries would rise up out of the ruins that would be left behind by the destruction of Rome. If you look around in world history, you can see the destruction of the things that Rome built. Some good, some bad. Now in verse nine, as I kept watching, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow and the hair of his head like white as wool. His throne was flaming fire its wheels were blazing fire. Daniel's dream continued. The Ancient of Days, who is this? The Ancient of Days took his seat. Who is this? The Ancient of Days was dressed in white like snow. Who is this? The Ancient of Days had hair on his head like whitest wool. Who is this? Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days took his throne. Who is this? This is God himself. Then the verse mentioned flaming fire and blazing fire. At this time, when God takes his throne, judgment began. The commentary mentioned the symbolism in this verse. White symbolizes pure, morally perfect. White hair symbolizes eternal holiness. Fire symbolizes judgment or wrath pour down on wicked people and those that reject him. Have you ever seen a wicked person, a hateful person, an evil person, or a God-rejected person and thought, huh, he needs to be punished? No, it's not our job to punish those people. It's only God's job because the Bible says we as individuals can't do this, but God will pass judgment one day out for those folks that eternally reject him and are evil to other people. Then Daniel chapter 10, 7, verse 10, a river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was convened and the books were opened. A powerful verse. In the vision of the future, God showed Daniel a river of fire streaming from God's presence. 10,000 times 10,000 signifies the largest number of people that could be counted during Daniel's time. Then it says, the court was open and the book was opened. The book, what's the book? The book is the life, book of life. It contains all the knowledge that only God himself has regarding every person. As I studied this week and as I studied, I asked myself and I studied, what's in the book? And I got these answers. Some of the things that could be in the book is, did you accept Jesus while you were here on earth? Did you go to church while you were here on earth? Did you help others to see Jesus and maybe know Jesus better while you were here? Did you hurt anyone with your actions or with your tongue? while you heard on earth. Did you do anything needed that God would feel he would need to judge you for? That will be in the book. At this time, in this verse, the Bible says everything is complete. God is in control, the ancient of days. God is in control and passing out judgment based on the book of life. Then Daniel chapter seven, verses 11 and 12. Daniel says, I watched then because of the sound of the arrogant words, the horn was speaking. As I continued watching, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dimension was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. Daniel's dream continues. One of the horns most likely Someone like the devil began speaking his arrogant and pride of words. But then Daniel saw God's judgment was passed down. And this evil one 
was destroyed. The empires that still existed by the evil one was trampled down by the ancient of days. God was in control. Verse 13, I continued watching in the night visions and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. Daniel's dream reaches a climax and ending. The son of man approaches the ancient of days. Jesus is now walking on the clouds toward God. This week as I studied, uh, and, and the, the best way I can explain these two verses is this. It gives thought that possibly Jesus had returned to earth like he promised. He had passed judgment to the evil folks on earth. The saved and the saints had been buried, had been sent to heaven, and to close it out, after it's all over, Jesus himself returns on the clouds to be with God. Then Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. He was given dominion and glory in a kingdom, so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Daniel saw the ancient of days. God give the son of man, Jesus, dominion over the glory and kingdom and complete authority over his saints. At this time, Jesus is in control of all those believers that have been in heaven. The commentary closed and said, not only will Christ's kingdom be universal, but will be eternal, unlike our earthly kingdom that we live in today with all the chaos and the evil going on. We no doubt have hope. No doubt the last two years, we've seen what we think is the most turmoil, the most chaotic world that we've ever seen during our lifetime. With the COVID pandemic changing our everyday lives, with the shortage of workers, our grocery store shelves empty, inflation is at a 40 year high, illegal immigration is the worst in history, and yet, God says, stay by me, I will stay by you. We wonder if life will ever return to what we consider normal. The author reminds her us of two world wars in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Those folks thought it was the worst ever. But now we may say, no, now is the worst ever. But as chapter 7 in Daniel's dream teaches us, evil and chaos might continue, as God's word says. But as God's word promises, we are on a journey as God's children toward the climax where Jesus will take dominion over all his believers. God's word also promises he will not leave us here on earth to walk alone. As I mentioned to my friend last week and right now, God is our only hope in our world that we live in today. See you next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for this lesson. Lord, we pray that we tried to get, we've tried to simplify it so that the folks that listen to it each week will understand just a little bit more. We understand it's apocalyptic uh, literature, Lord, and it's a, a vision you give Daniel to share with us as we live in a world that's so evil and so chaotic that we might still have hope. And our only hope is in Jesus Christ. Forgive us of our sins. Touch those that's sick. Touch those that suffered bereavement this week. Lord, bless our church. Keep us close to you. Forgive us of our sins. For us in Christ's name we do pray. Amen and see you next week.